Good afternoon and welcome to the council folks. My name is Charlie Pacello. I'm your host, uh, the host of the council and I'm just uh, so excited about our guest today and uh, the conversation that we're going to have about military in the rear view mirror and talking about suicide prevention and some really important information that we're going to be providing you today as we continue on with this very special Veterans Summit special series that the Council is in partnership with the Trauma Sensitive Awareness Foundation. It is a 10-part series here on KUHS TV radio and we are dedicating this 10-part special series to our veterans and their loved ones with information, hope, inspiration, and healing. As far as we know, this is a first-of-its-kind summit, and we are exploring cutting-edge treatments and alternative therapies for PTS, TBI, moral injury, sleep disturbance, family conflict, emotional trauma, and so much more. We're talking to mental health experts, veterans, and their advocates, and we are going to provide answers, resources, and solutions to bring all of our warriors home. We are starting the dialogue and we are going to continue the conversation. We want to come and enjoy the conversation. Come join in with the conversation and learn more about part two, which is debuting in November. So this series is going on all the way through September 25th and we are broadcasting live here on KUHSDenver.com. KUHS, the stream. We are broadcasting live here in the beautiful city of Denver, Colorado. Uh, it's a gorgeous day out here in Denver. Beautiful mountains, blue skies, and we are broadcasting all across the nation and all around the world. The council is being listened to by people on six different continents, so many different, over 40 different countries, and we thank you so much for tuning in every week to listen to the council for the information, the guests, the, the incredible speakers that we have on this show to give you uh, the hope and inspiration to uplift your life. And so thank you for trusting us every week to bring you the best that we possibly can. Well, I am uh, uh, very excited to introduce our next guest. And uh, you know, we, have, uh, we have an issue, one of the reasons that we decided to do this show and this series was because of the um, because of the, the suicide rate that's going on in the military right now. And it's been going on for some time. Um, and it is, uh, unfortunately, it's one of those things that is, we have to be able to face it and deal with it and look at it and see it for what it is so that we can help and reach out to our veterans and their families so that they know that there's people out there who are there to help them. That there are resources available, that there are signs and signals that our loved ones can look at that can help them to notice if their <clears throat> if their veteran is in need, and to break down the stigma of mental health. Uh, and it's not uh, something that you should look at as as being weak or or as wrong for getting the help that we need or our veterans that they need. That it's actually a signal that we, uh, by getting taking care of our mental health, we're looking at uh, getting stronger again. That we would treat uh, if we got an, an injury to our arm, we wouldn't uh, ha hesitate to go to the doctor. But and but we've got to have that same kind of attitude when we're talking about our mental and emotional and spiritual health, because we are integrated beings. We are, you know, we look on on four planes of existence: the spiritual plane, the mental plane, the emotional plane, and the physical plane. And when our, the three on the inside are not working so well, it's going to make the outside really hard to navigate. And, you know, suicide, I came close to uh, suicide. And so being able to come back from that, and, and I didn't know about the resources available to me out there uh, at that time in my life. And so we want to be able to provide that for veterans and their families so that they know where to go to. And one of the people that you can go to is the gentleman that I'm about to introduce to you right now. His name is Dwayne France, and he is the Director of Veteran Services for the Family Care Center, a private mental health clinic here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He is the Executive Director of the Colorado Veteran Health and Wellness Agency, a nonprofit professionally affiliated with the Family Care Center. 
Upon retiring from the Army after a 22-year career, including five combat and operational deployments, France began serving as a clinical mental health counselor in 2014. He is a member of the inaugural class of the George W. Bush Institute Veteran Leadership Program, a program that supports individuals <clears throat> from diverse sectors across the country who are motivated to increase their impact in helping our nation's veterans. In addition to his clinical work, he writes and speaks about veteran mental health uh, in a wide variety of settings. He has presented at national conferences on mental health and wellness in the military population. He has authored three books and is the founder and host of Headspace and Timing, a blog and podcast that brings the information from the clinical community to service members, veterans, and their families. He is also the co-host of the Seeking the Military Suicide Solution podcast, highlighting the need for practical solutions to address suicide in the military-affiliated populations. He uh, has written this book called Military in the Rearview Mirror, and I've been reading it. I'm almost done with it. It is fantastic. He speaks from authenticity. He speaks from the heart that strength and compassion. Uh, he gets it, he gets it, he gets it, and he can tell you how to be able to move through these difficulties that all veterans are the move through, the questions that we have, the inability to be able to make sense and how we create chaos and how to be able to reduce everything. It's right in here. So military in the rear view mirror. And you can find that at the website uh, is at veteranmentalhealth.com. That's veteranmentalhealth.com. Welcome to the show, to the council, Dwayne. Thank you, Charlie. I appreciate it. <laughs> Well, I would love for us to just get right at it because, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I find your, your work to be incredible and specific to what's going on in the military veteran population. And But before we get started into it, I would love for us or for you to share a little bit about your background and um, why you joined the military. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. So uh, like many of us, I joined the military back way back in the last century, right? So uh, <laughs> early in the early 90s, uh, I was in high school when the uh, Gulf War happened. And, and of course, we all saw that on, uh, on TV. Uh, my father and three of my uncles were all Vietnam veterans, but they had all served and they'd gotten out of the military by the time I came along. And so I sort of grew up in the military life, um, obviously a kid of the 80s and, and seeing the, the uh, Vietnam Memorial come up, seeing the Berlin Wall go down. Uh, it, but really, it was uh, sort of senior year of high school, and I didn't know what I wanted to do, and I was tired of living in my dad's basement, and I tried a semester at college, and that didn't work very well. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to go full time. Uh, and so I did. I enlisted. I, I was uh, in the reserves for about eight months, uh, and then I decided that I really wanted to do it full time. Uh, first tour was uh, in Germany. When I joined, they said, because uh, I was in logistics, they said, you can be a truck driver in Texas, you can be a truck driver in Germany. Which do you want? I said, I can go to Texas anytime. So uh, my first tour of duty was in, uh, was in Germany. Um, went to Bosnia. Uh, Dayton Peace Accords happened in late 95, so we were there in 96. Uh, the first one's on the ground there. Um, and then uh, spent three years in the 82nd Airborne Division. Uh, went back to Germany for another three years. I was there when 9-11 happened. And then, uh, uh, and then I wanted to try to volunteer again, uh, go to combat, and the Army said, well, if you want to volunteer, here's recruiting duty for you. So the first years of the war I spent uh, in the front office, uh, but then, of course, um, left that 2005, got here to Fort Carson, and did uh, one of the 15-month tour, uh, 15 tours in Iraq, uh, two Afghanistan tours, and Finished out my career in the 10th Special Forces Group uh, support element uh, and then uh, sort of rode a parachute off into the sunset. Wow, <clears throat> what an amazing career that you've had. And, and, and it spans uh, two centuries, <laughs> literally, you, you began. And I think you and I both started in the military about the same time. Like I, I started around 1991, and I think you, you joined around 1992. And um, when, you, when you think back at your military service, um, what do you think really makes a person a warrior? Is it, is, do you have to, because you deployed on, on, on four combat tours, four combat tours, yes? 
uh, uh, you know, Bosnia, they were throwing rocks and we were shooting at us, but there were really three combat tours and uh, two operational three. deployments. So you deployed and, and, and you were in combat. Does it, do you have to be a warrior to, and do you have to go to combat and deploy to be a warrior? What really, what are the attributes that makes a warrior a warrior in your mind? You know, obviously, if you think about uh, the literal definition of a warrior, then, you know, certainly you would think about a combat veteran or a soldier, even going back to ancient Greek and Roman days, right, the Spartans. And, and that's one area where people think about warriors. But really, uh, warriorship is, is as much of a mindset. Mm -hmm. So thinking about someone who faces adversity and doesn't quit or, or faces adversity and gets through it, right? And, so, so now, and, and it doesn't cheapen the word, I think, but we, we talk about people who survive the battle with cancer as warriors. Um, you know, the people that, that battle uh, invisible injury as warriors, physical pain, chronic pain, right? And so really, in, in, again, literally, yes, one has to have been a combat veteran to be a warrior, but also in a, a much broader sense, just somebody who doesn't give up, somebody who even though it sucks, even though it hurts, even though the pain is there, that you get through it and you come out the other side. Well, and I think that's so important is that it's it's almost, we we'll all have that. It's like an energy that we have, that we can move forward in that warrior spirit. It's that ability, like you said, to overcome that adversity, that ability to be able to see through things and not to give up, to keep moving forward, to embrace the suck sometimes. You know, sometimes things... Are not fun, but we, we and that's one of the things we learned in the military was to how to keep going in the in the face of adverse circumstances. And what an interesting turn, uh, Dwayne, that you made in that you became a mental health professional. Uh, well, you weren't a mental health professional in the in the military, uh, so how did how did you make that shift uh, before or after you retired? So in, uh, it's a great question, uh, and it's one that I often get, right? Because a lot of times if you have veterans who are in the mental health field, uh, they had some type of association with mental health in the military, either as a mental health tech or as a, a psych doc themselves or something like that. Um, but really for me, as I mentioned, I was in logistics. It was a purpose. It was a job. But it wasn't something that I found fulfilling. What I found fulfilling was leading troops, right? You know, so that platoon sergeant, that first sergeant, right, that really caring for people. And so in some sense, I was a mental health professional in the way that especially leaders are, are peers and, and interested in the, the well-being of their soldiers. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I was coming back from Iraq uh, in 2007, I think it was at this time. So uh, October 2006 to December of 2007. And we were going through the reintegration process and uh, the, um, you know, that thing where, you know, don't kick the dog and don't throw cans at the neighbors and stuff like that, right? You know, don't be, be goofballs. And in the, um, in the class uh, that we were at was a retired major and she was the, the uh, clinical director of our local veteran um, uh, VA vet center. And so just sort of as an aside, she said, you know, if, if you're interested in psychology, you should really consider a career in the mental health field because there are not enough combat veterans in the mental health field and there are veterans out there that need the help. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of a stone that was dropped into my mind. About the same time, uh, the Veterans Court here in uh, Veterans Trauma Court here in El Paso County in Colorado Springs was starting to stand up and I saw that in the paper and I'm like, you know, those troops are really going to need to know or need to have somebody who knows where they're coming from, right? You know, that you know, knows the smell of the blood and the dirt and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so those two things together, I think, happened within a year of each other, and it really kind of solidified my desire to go down the path. And, and really, it's a way to continue my service. Um, I just don't have to jump out of airplanes anymore. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I think it is uh, it is a, a huge difference from jumping out of airplanes. Uh, and, and you mentioned that, uh, you know, being that you're a combat veteran, uh, do you find that it, because you're a combat veteran and have had those experiences in, on the field, in, in, the, in the heat of battle, that people who are coming to you feel more, that they're able to share the things that are, are hidden within their souls, and that, that they, the secrets that they're keeping, that they're making them sick, do you find that they find you, uh, that they can speak to you about these things that are haunting them? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and for a couple of different reasons. One, a veteran doesn't need a very good reason to avoid therapy, right? Any reason is a good reason, right? So if I can say I don't want to go to therapy because this person doesn't know combat, then, then they're going to do it. So it removes one of those excuses, let's say. Yeah. Also, it's not something that we do a lot, right? You know, we can kick in doors in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the hardest door that I've seen veterans try to get through is the closed door into my office because they don't know what's on the other side. They know, I mean, they may not know what's on the other side of the door in Iraq and Afghanistan, but they know that they can handle that. On the other side of my door, they're not certain, but they walk in my office and it looks like a retired first sergeant's office, right? I got maps on the walls and I got coins on the table. So immediately they can say, ah, okay, this person understands, this person gets it. Right. And so there's that sort of psychological. So all of these barriers are kind of dropping. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's a matter of the fact a lot of veterans, they want to hold in what they're talking about. They don't want to reveal it to themselves, but they also have a concern that they don't want to hurt other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if they feel they tell their traumatic stories, that they're going to hurt the person, that they're going to cause the person that they're telling distress. And they don't want to do that. Now, they know that I've been there, so they don't have to worry about distressing me because I, I've already been through that. So those are three things that little by little it helps a veteran do that. However, you don't have to be a combat veteran to be able to do those things. I'm not saying, you know, decorate your office, um, but re a really good uh, counselor or therapist who is, wants to work with veterans, they can develop that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Dr. Tick, when he, was, he was not a veteran himself, and yet he was somebody who uh, absolutely got to um, be one of the leading voices in the military. And so you don't have to be a veteran, much less a combat veteran. It does help. The other piece, though, is that sometimes a veteran will, will use my service as a reason to skip over their story. So they'll be getting to a really hard place and they'll be like, ah, but you know what it was like. And so I'm going to jump over that piece. Well, I know what it was like for me, but I need to know what it was like for you. Yeah. And I, and I think that is, you know, people can uh, understand and listen to you. Uh, it's just a, like having a good therapist or counselor or coach. You've got to be able to be willing to sit with the person and, n and not be triggered by what's being spoken about. And, and for veterans out there, you know, you've got to be able to trust the person that you're saying these things to. It's about someone who, who cares more about you and your health and your well-being and versus whatever that happens you know, to them. There's nothing going to impact them enough because their love for you is going to surmount anything that uh, you could possibly say to them. So getting over this stigma is such a huge thing for veterans. How, and you know what, I, I think um, our, our Vietnam veterans didn't show up until about 40 years later after the, the war was done, and then our, our Iraq and Afghanistan veterans are, are, are hesitant to come in to see. Do you think that in the future we're going to be needing more people who are going to be, have to be able to, to see veterans because of the issues that are, they're not dealing with right now? So there's a couple of things there, but yes, number one, there's not enough, uh, there's a, a lack of mental health professionals in general uh, in the United States, right? The demand is much greater than the supply for those of us who are in the mental health field. Um, and yes, there is going to be an increasing demand. Um, the, the current global war on terrorism combat cohort is the largest cohort to combat veterans since World War II. More people, more post 9-11 veterans have deployed to combat than they did to Vietnam. And it's not a comparison. And yes, the current uh, um, era of veterans are only probably a quarter of the World War II veterans, but just the sheer size and number, and even the longevity of these conflicts. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if your listeners know, but we're in the first cross-generational conflict in American history. Never has there been a conflict that has lasted spanned three generations. If you think the, the generations of warriors at the beginning of these conflicts, the senior leaders in the Department of Defense, Peter Pace, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, was a platoon commander in Vietnam. So we've got Vietnam era veterans mm -hmm. that are leading the military 30, 40 years later. Then you have my generation. My son was born one month before 9-11. He could go enlist in the military, get the same job I had, go deploy to the same place I had, and potentially get into a battle in the same location I did. That's never happened. And that is, uh, that, that is a, a longevity issue. And unfortunately, I think, you know how they say the oldest living World War II veteran? I think the oldest living Global War on Terror veteran probably has not joined the military yet. Yeah. That's incredible. I didn't know that. That's really, I didn't realize that it was that 
such a huge cross section of our veteran uh, community uh, that we're involved in this. That's uh, that's some new information for me. And but there is something that is universal for all veterans whenever they're coming back from war. Is that not all of them? You know, there's some that don't, but there's a lot that are challenged um, by the return, uh, and uh, they're they're trying to figure out uh, how to how to fit into a world that maybe doesn't make sense to them anymore. And uh, you know, you have in your book here, you have a wonderful quote in one of uh, in one of the uh, articles. You write. My life has been full of terrible misfortunes, most of which never happened, which was Michel de Montaigne. I love him. It's fantastic. But veterans come back and we're carrying burdens, and burdens from maybe, uh, maybe for, uh, the things that we saw, maybe the things that we did, or uh, the guilt or shame that we may feel, or unprocessed uh, emotions, rage, whatever it may be. And we're we're carrying those burdens, and it's and it can be a weight, it can be crushing, it can be paralyzing, and that weight of the past. And all of a sudden now, it feels like you can't get that weight off, and now you dread the future because you've been so conditioned to think about the worst case scenario. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, what's the mo what's the worst thing that could possibly happen here? Uh, Dwayne, why do we do this as veterans, and what is actually going on inside of our brains when we're doing this? So it's actually, and, and you're, it's good that you said that, that it actually is in our brains. You know, I, I once told a veteran, I said, it's all in your head, and he was like, ah, but it's all in your brain. Like, literally, our brains are adapting to this. Uh, and what's happening is when we join the military, regardless of which branch we came into, regardless of which, regardless of whether we went through, you know, uh, Beast Barracks or, or Hell Week at one of the service academies, or we went into uh, uh, a uh, basic training, we were acculturized into a different culture. Everything that makes up a culture, a definition of a culture, we wear different clothes, we speak different languages. I speak both expletive and acronym fluently, right? <laughs> so we speak differently. We translate knowledge differently. Um, and so we act, it's, it, I, I describe it as, as if we, I went to go live in Ireland for 22 years. Yeah, we maybe speak English, but it's a totally different culture. Now I have to come back and live in a location that I really don't understand. So just the fact that you're in military service causes us to think differently mm -hmm. um, and, and it causes us to experience a different culture. So now we get out of the military, regardless of all the other stuff that's in our rucksack, um, we think differently. We have different experiences. Veterans and their families, because they travel with them, have much more global experiences. Um, a lot of my family, I've got a large uh, number of cousins, most of them live within 90 miles of where we grew up. And, and you know, they don't travel. We don't, we don't tend to leave locations very much. But by the time I was 21, I'd been 21. I'd been to more countries than I'd been to states, and so it's one of those things where when we leave the military, we have a different mindset, but we don't have the same kind of transformative um, uh, experience leaving the military that we did coming in. So we're acculturized on the way in, but we are not acculturized into this new place on the way out, mm -hmm. and we don't really fit anywhere. So we were this one thing called a soldier service member, what have you. Now we're not a civilian. We're this weird mix between the two that's called a veteran. So even that can be challenging. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of different things, the different mindsets that apply. And then on top of that, you place the challenges, the, 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 the painful knees and the backs and stuff like that, but also the soul wounds uh, and the burdens that we have mm -hmm. um, that now that we're out, we're not around people that understand us anymore, and we don't even really understand what's going on ourselves. And so a lot of it compounds, and it's exponential, mm -hmm. um, and, and it can really cause a burden for a lot of individuals. Well, and, and it does, and, and I know from my own experience, you know, it, uh, the burdens that I carried for some of the work that I did, uh, I felt a profound sense of uh, guilt and, and, and couldn't let allow yeah. myself to for, even forgive myself for some of the things that I did. And so it's so important to recognize that, you know, there's nothing wrong with us. <laughs> We're okay. We've just got to be able to talk to someone to unburden ourselves to unpack our rucksack a little bit and help, help to carry so that we can get a clear idea about what's actually happening and what's going on within us. And we're, 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 we are, as veterans, we tend to think negatively a lot of times. Is, is negative thinking something that we are just born to do? Or 
is there a way we can start to break that negative thinking? Because that negative thinking can lead to a lot of the things that we're about to talk about here in just a moment. But if we could do some kind of preventative measures, I think we could help a lot of veterans right now who are, are trying to figure out, you know, what's going on inside of me. Well, sure, and the negative thinking can lead to that, but the problem is, is in the military, the negative thinking was actually protective, mm. right? You know, if, if mm. we're in combat, um, we need to think of about the, mo the enemy's most dangerous course of act in the future, the most catastrophic event I can think of, and then I need to prepare for it, right? right? That's why we have 3 T4s and a Claymore in the back of our truck. And so we, we get into that mindset so that, it, and it helps us, and it makes us prepared, and it keeps us alive, and it helps us bring our troops home. Mm -hmm. And so back then it was good, but now you mean you tell me it was bad? Because you told me it was good, and so there's a confusion there. There's a paradox that, that we need to help veterans resolve is to say, even with emotions, anger is appropriate in combat. Fear, of course, you're going to be, it's okay. And so those emotions that may be maladaptive in a different environment, they're, they're you know, acceptable. Although those emotions over here, right, you know, the, the concern for others and the, the, the easygoingness and the sense of peace, those are actually dangerous when we're in combat. That's, that's true. Now we go back to the civilian world, and so... We, all that caring for my wife and, and, and concern for other people, I'm not used to doing that. But now the anger and the fear is no longer acceptable. And so there's this switch that we have to make to go back and forth. Um, but then it's a matter of, like you said, how do we do it? One, recognize that the negative way that we see the world, the way that we think and talk, especially about ourselves, mm -hmm. you talk about the guilt that you bear for, for for what you were experiencing, the negative things we say about ourselves, they may have, maybe not entirely, but they may have been helpful then, but we need to recognize that they're not helpful now. Mm -hmm. It was good then, it's not good now. How do I change it? First, I have to be aware of it. I have to capture those thoughts. I have to recognize what they're, what they're saying. Then I need to consciously take action to change it because I can be aware of something all day long and I could say, you know what? I kind of like being a jerk. I, I don't want to change. <laughs> well, then you're not going to change because you're not going to take action. So action, awareness plus action is what's going to lead to change. And, and that was so true. Uh, you know, I, it, it took me a long time to recognize the negative thinking that I had gotten into and that I was recycling the same thoughts over and over again every day. And, uh, and it was just, it, you know, it was, I was suffering more from my thoughts and the things that I was thinking rather than from the events that actually happened back then when they did happen. Not to say they weren't traumatic, they were, but my thinking about it made it worse and it made it cycle down and it kept going into a very ugly place. And it wasn't until I became aware that I was doing that, that I was doing this to myself, that I was inflicting it on myself, that I started to say, wait, I don't have to stay stuck here. I can start to change the way I'm thinking and I can take some actions to start doing that. And every time I feel that impulse not to do something or I'm going to sabotage myself or I'm going into that depressive state, let me do something else. Let me think of what is something good. Let me, let me realize it's a, what a gift it is to wake up today and breathe. Let me think, let me, even if it was just one little action like that, it made all the difference. Now, we are talking suicide here as well, and it is a major issue uh, among our veteran community. And you've been uh, doing the, uh, the, the, the podcast of Seeking the Military Suicide Solution. As you know, post-military life can lead to a lot of challenges mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Uh, if we lose track of meaning and purpose, we can slip into that hopelessness and depression. I know this, I know this, yes. And the combination of these two is especially hopelessness. When you have no more hope, um, it, you are much at a much greater risk for suicide. Um, what are some preventative steps that we can do so that we don't get into the trap of hopelessness, Dwayne? Well, again, one of the first things is to really sort of be aware that there's the potential for that. You know, I, I often, one of the things, uh, one of the books that I often refer to 
uh, my clients is uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, mm -hmm. right? And, and I read Man's Search for Meaning before I deployed to combat, and then I read it after I deployed to combat, and I read it in a totally different way. But one of the things that Frankl says in that book is he could tell when one of his fellow inmates was, was, was finally going to die very soon because they would start smoking their own cigarettes because in the, in the camps, the cigarettes were a, a form of currency, right? Mm -hmm. But once they start smoking their own cigarettes, he could tell that they had no intention of living beyond the, the time that once I run out of these cigarettes, the hope was gone. They didn't have a hope of being able to continue to barter with these cigarettes. And so it's this idea, of, one, of saying, even in, if we're in the most difficult of circumstances, we can still find meaning. And that's, that's all of what man's search for meaning is, is finding meaning in suffering, noble meaning. Um, but recognizing that as we're suffering, and that's worth a discussion of pain is pain, but we know pain's gonna end. Suffering is pain that has, that we don't see ending. Mm -hmm. See, suicide is really a, 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 an attempt to stop suffering. Mm -hmm. Physical suffering, emotional suffering, psychological suffering, spiritual suffering with guilt if I, I feel things, right? And so in many different ways that it is, it's a way for us to stop the suffering that we're in. And if we don't have the hope of the suffering ending, either through our efforts or the efforts of other people, mm -hmm then we believe that that might be the case. And it usually isn't, right? So we usually view long-lasting pain that hasn't changed as suffering and assume that it's that we're always going to be suffering, but we're not. We have to understand that there are certain things that I can do to ease my suffering or go to others and have them help me ease it for me. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's true. You wanna, one of the reasons that I want, and when I, got, when I was on the board of, of suicide alleviation is that, that I just wanted the pain to stop. I mean, that was like one of the biggest things is I just, I didn't know how else to end, I didn't know how else to stop it. Right. Uh, and it was, it was, it was like, this is the only way I could do it because it was so excruciating. It was the most excruciating, unendurable pain I'd ever been in my whole life. And it wouldn't leave me. It would never go away. And it was followed. It was haunting. It was just, it was miserable. Absolutely. And, and it was just like, oh my gosh. And I didn't have a support. I didn't have the social community and everything that you, you talk about in your book here. It's so, it's so on point. Um, but there are a lot of misconceptions uh, about suicide in the in the military affiliated population. I, I wish you could you address some of these, Dwayne, the, some of the common misconceptions about suicide that people may not know of uh, about our military population. Yeah, and so some of these are really suicides uh, myths about suicide that people have in general. Um, one of them is is people think that if if I feel like somebody is contemplating suicide, they haven't said it, I got the sense, there's a gut feeling, they may or may not be, but if I say it, I may be planting the thought in their head, right? So that would cause somebody to say, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say the word because by saying the word, it might make them do the deed. Mm -hmm. They're already thinking about it. Even if they're not thinking about it specifically, if you have that gut instinct, they are already thinking about it. So that's one of the myths of, of suicide is that if I reach out and I say, hey, hey brother, hey sister, are you thinking of taking your own life? Are you thinking of killing yourself? That I don't wanna do that if I think that's gonna harm the other person. Mm -hmm. It's actually not the case. It's actually more likely research shows that actually reaching out and talking about it specifically is going to have them open up. Because what we all really wanna do, what you wanted to do at that time, was for people to understand what was happening. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be heard, we need to be listened to. Um, another common myth is, uh, is one that is around um, methods, methods of, of suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, and so especially in the military and veteran population, firearms far and away um, are the most um, used method of, of lethal means. Um, poisoning, overdoses, there are more attempts, but if there's less lethality. Mm -hmm. With firearms, there's less attempts, but obviously there's more lethality because of the method. Some people think that if I, if I intervene with one method, then somebody who's really, really wants to take their own life, they're just gonna jump to another method. Mm -hmm. Also, research shows that that's not the case. That isn't the way it works, that if you, that, it seems to be that an individual has a way that they're considering, a preferred method, if you wanna describe it like that. And if you, if you interrupt their access, or if you help them more specifically interrupt the access to that method, then they're not gonna switch over to another type of method. Um, then it's actually putting time and space in between that. And so this is another thing that we don't do as much as not just me, but many of us in this space think that we have to have conversations around 
lethal means safety, mm -hmm. firearms, prescription medications, and suicide hotspots, because suicide happens in a very, very confined space, right? Especially if somebody is in that very, very critical crisis, it, it, we can be on the continuum for a period of time, but that moment of crisis really lasts a matter of hours, if not minutes. And so if we can put time between that seemingly overwhelming urge for someone mm -hmm. and then their, the, the access to their method, chances are that time is gonna pass and then they'll be able to get the help. So I think those are two of the biggest ones mm -hmm. that I have heard that have caused people to not really wanna have the conversations about it. Well, that makes sense. And, and I, you know, I've heard, and, and when I was uh, doing some of my training, one of the things uh, that they trained us, and I, I think it was, I can't remember the, but it was, you wanted, if somebody was about to commit suicide, you wanted to address it. Are you thinking about taking your life? Are you thinking about suicide? I mean, it was about bringing it out so that it wasn't hidden. You didn't, you didn't tiptoe around it uh, because they're already thinking about it anyway. I was already kind of thinking about it anyway when I was at that time. I, I mean, and, and so, you know, it was something that needed to kind of come out of me, but I needed someone to be able to have, not be afraid to talk to me about these things. I mean, that's for me, uh, that's what I needed at that time. And you describe in your book such a beautiful way, uh, maybe it's not beautiful, but it's an accurate way of what suicide is, that it happens on a continuum. Could you explain that to our audience, what that continuum is, and, and, and so that people can know uh, and, and, and identify it in themselves or, or somebody else that may be considering it? Sure, and, and, and sometimes, you know, usually this comes with slides and a whiteboard, right? But, but <laughs> if, if your listeners can sort of visualize, uh, is really we have to change uh, how we think and, and even how we talk about suicide. And, and as an aside, and, and, and not a knock on you, uh, but many people use the phrase committing suicide. But really there's, a, there's a, an attempt to try to change the language around that because committing something mm -hmm. is, is we're committing a crime. We commit murder, but really we need to look at, you know, someone dying by suicide. A, a commitment is, is something that, you know, we're committed to a cause. Um, whereas if we change the way, and again, it's not, it's not a knock on it, but it's how we're using this language around it. And another mm -hmm. uh, type of changing the way that we're thinking about it really is about suicide is not an on or off proposition. It's not that you're either suicidal or you're not. It is not binary. Uh, and so really we look at, we, we have three different um, uh, stages in, in a couple of um, steps in each stage. So first you have sort of a contemplation type stage where you have ideations, right? So first you have vague ideations where you're not thinking specifically of, I'm going to take my own life. It's more things like, you know, maybe it'd be, just be easier if I wasn't here. You know, I wish I wouldn't wake up tomorrow. You know, some of these just vague, you know, I'm, those thoughts are yeah. starting to creep in. And then you go into these specific ideations. You know, I, I could really take my own life. I could really kill myself. I want to die. So there are the differences just sort of, you know, vaguely talking about it versus using the actual words of death, kill, and die. Mm -hmm. uh, then when you move from ideation and then you start thinking about the behaviors, once you start thinking specifically about not just whether I want to do it, but that I'm going to do it and how I'm going to do it, how I'm going to gather the methods, how I'm going to actually, you know, um, uh, thinking about um, taking my car up off the Gold Camp Road here in Colorado Springs, or I've got the knives in the other room, or what have you, right? So moving beyond the can I do it or should I do it to the how will I do it, mm -hmm. and then you actually start gathering materials to put that in place, right? I, I start putting, you know, I, 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 you know, I have a friend of mine, uh, and, and this can be kind of graphic for some of your listeners, and so if this is a concern for them, I, I have some concern about that. Uh, but I have a friend, uh, Green Beret, who said that he used to walk around the house with a 45, I mean, 45 round in his hand, just tossing it up and down, telling himself, is this the night that I'm going to have the courage to put it in my gun? Mm -hmm. That's suicidal behavior, right? That's moving beyond just the, the thought to, I'm actually engaging in certain behaviors. And then you have an attempt putting those those uh, behaviors into action. And then you actually have uh, the 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 act of suicide. So really you have this long continuum, mm -hmm. but if we can catch it in the top end or someone can help us catch it for us, if we can throw someone with the lifeline when they're farther upstream, when they're having these conversations, because a lot of times people don't say, hey, I'm drowning until they're at the far end. 
if we can start to move this conversation that if you're if you're say, if you're having thoughts of death, kill, and die, you're not at the edge of the cliff yet. Where we're not going to put you in a hospital. We need to talk about this so we can stop it now and get you back to to safer ground. Because if it does get to the point where you're almost at the edge, well, then we have to to take different measures. Well, and you know when you are elucidating some of the things that your thoughts and you, and you know those ideas and and it's exactly what I, the process where I was just like it would be better I wasn't around and then how would I do it and boy I could drive it off right off this cliff and I mean so those are the thoughts that I was having and and, and boy if you're exactly if we can catch it before that and you recognize it and you see them you feel like you're telling it that's an indication a signal right there call somebody reach out reach out to Dwayne, talk to somebody who can help you to get over this, because all you're needing is, is someone to hear your truth, someone to see your soul, someone to, to hear your story and not flinch, someone who's going to be able to say, my gosh, I'm, I'm here with you, and I'm going to stand right beside you, and I'm not going to let you go. I mean, that's what, uh, that's what, what we're calling, that's what we're crying out for. And, um, you know, there is a lot of, so there's a lot that people are trying to do to address um, suicide in the military with service members with veterans and, and their families um, Dwayne in your opinion why do you think that the numbers continue to rise well I think a lot of it um, is that there seems to be a lot of resources but then there's also a gap between those that need to use that resources there's still a ton of stigma uh, around um, around mental health, and here we're talking about just the U.S. in general. Um, and, and let me put it this way, not even just the U.S. I've had guests on my show, uh, Sue Freed from the U.K. about combat stress, uh, 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 Barry Swarstein from Australia talking about Australian veterans. I mean, so this isn't just a U.S. veteran problem, even more than it's a U.S. problem. This is a global situation that we need to address. Um, but there is a lot of stigma around seeking the support um, once we do get the support, we keep telling everybody, knock on our door, knock on our door. But when somebody knocks on our door, we have to be ready to respond. So we have to answer the door. So making sure that that individual has the right kind of care. Um, but really, it's an understanding around this. See, suicide is a lagging indicator of an underlying problem. Suicide is not the problem that needs to be solved. It's just the end result of some other underlying problem. Um, less than or approximately 50% of veteran suicides have or met the criteria for a psychological diagnosis. Other times it's financial issues, it's relationship issues, it's belongingness issues. It's not, it's not the fact that they have a diagnosable mental health condition, it's the fact that they can't get their needs met, that they're homeless or things like that. And so really it, it, the the problem is it's so complicated that we're all looking for this one solution that's why the the name of the podcast is a misnomer there is no solution mm -hmm. no single solution for the problem of, of service member veteran military family suicide really it's a matter of we don't need here's a hamburger we need the whole buffet we need to have if you want pizza you go get pizza you want lobster go get lobster you need you know steak you go get steak and so we have a wide range of interventions for whatever that individual is experiencing or causing their suffering that they're able to get that. And I think that's so important for people to know is that there's a wide variety. There's no one solution to why somebody is on the edge of suicide. I mean, there's so many multiple factors. And, and a lot of times it's individual. A lot of times it's their personal experience. It's early traumatic memories that are, have been unprocessed or undigested. And, could be adverse childhood experiences. It could be the experiences Absolutely. that they had in the military. It could be, um, you know, uh, d dysfunctional relationships. It could uh, so many things. And so you describe veterans right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And so it's, but it, the, one of the key factors that I think in, in helping people is is re letting people know that there's resources out there and to not to not be hesitate to reach out to people who are willing and ready and want to help you to, to understand what's going on, to, to, to value and cherish your life, that your life is worth living, that you're precious to this planet, that you're precious to life. And, 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 and I think you wanted to say something. It looked like you wanted to say something, Dwayne. Yeah, and, and, and ex exactly, Pat. And, and unfortunately, we do want people to reach out, but we want them to reach out at a time 
where they're most least likely to reach out or they have the least capability of reaching out. So this is something else that really we talked about on my show is that we need to get away from this passive resource offering call me if you need me right um, you know this this resource is here on the shelf somewhere so you can come get it off the shelf when you need it when really we need to be more active proactive and reaching out to individuals and say hey you look like you're suffering mm -hmm. and and how do I help you alleviate that we don't have to use those words but understanding that all of these other factors, veteran homelessness, veteran unemployment, yeah. a lack of purpose and meaning, all of these different things that cause this guilt, if, if someone is doing that, if someone is working, doing excellent work in veteran homelessness, they're preventing suicide. Mm -hmm. The person that brought me coffee this morning, the, the, the barista at my local coffee shop, they're preventing suicide. Suicide prevention is everyone's job. And if we can help everyone be better, even to the point of knowing if someone's going through foreclosure, right? If I'm if I'm a bank loan officer and I can see that I'm about to foreclose on this VA loan, hey, this individual might also be at risk for suicide. So how can I reach out or, or have somebody reach out and give them these resources? So really getting, yes, we absolutely want to have the resources there for somebody to reach out and get it, but also we need to be proactive and be able to provide active resource delivery. Mm -hmm. Well, and, I, and I think that's a great point. Uh, you're absolutely right. And being much more active and, and not allowing ourselves just to say, yeah, we've got the resources here, but really being able to reach out. And we don't know, Dwayne, how the little kindnesses that we do every day, how much that, how important that is. Uh, a smile, uh, you know, like we were saying, the barista every morning giving you the, the coffee and, and uh, go, going out and saying, how are you doing? What's going on? Being interested in showing people that you care. And, I, and that you empathize with them and that you, that, you, that you give a shit. You know, I think that's one of the biggest things is that people want to know that you care. And, uh, and, but you've got to do it. It's got to be action. It can't be just words. You've got you to gotta, you gotta do it, too. You've got to walk the talk. And, uh, and a lot of times we, 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 we forget that sometimes. But, you know, that's why we have conversations like this on these, all, you know, these different media platforms to help to get the word out, to expand the knowledge, to inform and educate people. And I love this very unique, tr uh, non-traditional media that we have here. And you're doing the same thing uh, with your podcast and trying to inform and educate. Um, why do you think, Dwayne, it's important to use these non-traditional media to spread the word about suicide prevention uh, you know, doing the things that you're doing on your blog and your and your podcast. And so, and this is something, and and you know, I I love research articles. Uh, I was in college for ten years, uh, from from my associates to to my my master's degrees. Um, but research articles, all the theoretical stuff, that's written for other people who read research articles. I don't know about you, but I don't get up in the morning saying I need to check out the latest research article. <laughs> But I do open my local paper every day, or I do, you know, whatever my, what, however I consume information. Uh, and so avoiding, you know, again, if we talk about non-traditional channels, um, avoiding having these conversations on Twitter, on, on Facebook, and it is happening, you know, on, on Facebook, but, but not having these conversations. I actually had somebody one time say, you know, you're never going to reach veterans because uh, they're not talking about mental health. Uh, on social media online and I'm like have you seen Facebook lately because they're sure talking a lot about there mm -hmm. and and so we need to be able, this is something we t talk about in the clinical communities we need to be able to meet veterans where they're at uh, and and yes as you mentioned I've had the honor of having some some really neat uh, opportunities actually one just recently happened um, is that uh, uh, Hasbro GI Joe right so kid of the 80s like me GI Joe was the thing mm -hmm. Um, and so they actually relaunched a, a, a different version of the G.I. Joe universe, but just here on August 19th, they released an issue. I was, uh, I was able to consult on it in which it was actually addressing the psychological impact of combat. And, and one of the G.I. Joe characters, so Duke, you know, Duke and, and Scarlet, the two leaders of the G.I. Joe team, Duke is actually conducting an intervention with Scarlet because she's having a hard time uh, coming back from combat. And it goes through, you know, 18 months of her uh, treatment journey. And she says, the treatment's BS. I don't want to go into it. And she has setbacks and she has flashbacks. And then finally at the end, she is like, I'm at a better place. Um, but but it's a comic book, right? I mean, this, and, and it's a different way to get a different message out there. And once these 
these conversations start to hit the mainstream. It's happening on TV. It's happening in the movies. It's happening in comic books. And that's how we start to really, it's again, like the 80s. Once we started talking about HIV as an everyone problem, we got our hands around it. And so it's no longer the secret thing that's in the back. And so I think these ways, what you're doing here, uh, obviously what Dr. Tick has been doing for many years, getting the message out in as many different ways as we can get it out, people are starting to talk about it. I agree. And, 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 I, and it's just... Uh you know, informing people, letting them know um, that you can take control of your life. You can you can fill your surround yourself with people who care, and just by being able to immerse yourself in in these dialogues with people, you learn, you grow, and you educate yourself in ways that you didn't know before. And I think it's great because people can come back to it. You know, they don't have to watch it or listen to it right away. They can come back to it, and I think they get. That's what I one of the things that I love about uh, new media is that I can. I can say, well, I, I couldn't watch it today, but I can watch it tomorrow, or I can uh, listen to the podcast, and I can listen on my own at a different time. So I think we, the, the, the spread of this media is so much larger than we understand that uh, we can affect people and touch people, uh, you know, two years, three or four years, years, five years down the line. And so that's why yeah. I think it's so powerful. And especially when we're dealing with suicide, and like this series is dedicated to veterans and their families and you know we when we were talking before we started the show you know the idea is to hit that advice to someone who's listening right now who's watching this who's listening to it today tomorrow a year from now and who might be on the brink um another veteran another veteran brother another veteran sister uh who might be on the edge Dwayne what could we say? What could you say? Who's, uh, what do we want them to know that they can do right now? And, you know, it's, it's interesting, uh, and you alluded to it a little bit before, but uh, especially from, so we've conducted 50 interviews for the suicide-specific uh, podcast, and one of the main things is we just need to stop being jerks to each other. Because if we stop being jerks to each other, a lot of this stuff is going to be resolved. But that's really it is is to understand that as much as we might be individually hurting, other people could be hurting too. Uh, and so on the one hand, uh, for those individuals, and, and you're absolutely right, there's this one person who could be listening to this a year and a half, two and a half, three years from now. That's what we're doing with the, the Seeking the Military Suicide Solution. It's not just for today, but we're hoping that five years from now, somebody's going to get into this, this series and say, man, this is some good stuff. How do I apply it? Um, and it really boils down to putting your hand on somebody's shoulder, looking them in the eye and say, hey, I give a crap. Yeah. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. Right. What can I do for you? What are, wh how are you suffering? And you're not going to do that to a complete stranger. You could. Absolutely. I mean, this is a, and, and not a veteran story, but Kevin Hines, who is a, a, a well-known suicide survivor speaker, um, he talks about how his story, he was going to go throw himself off the Golden Gate Bridge, and he actually did and lived, which was part of the story. But he said, if one person would have reached out to me that day, I was crying on the, the, the public transportation. If one person would have said, hey, what's going on? He said, I would have told them, and I likely wouldn't have done what I did, right? So for the one thing is, is if you see someone suffering or sense someone suffering, especially a veteran, a brother and sister, put your hand on your shoulder, look them in the eye and say, I don't want you to die today. What can I do to keep that from happening? On the other, on the other side, if someone is in the middle of that dark place, recognize that you're not alone. You're not alone in this. Um, this is some a colleague uh, on the previous podcast, Dr. Phil Smith, University of South Alabama. He said, suicide is both common and rare. It's common in that all of us have been affected by it in one way, shape, or form, either personally or someone, or we lost someone close. So, so it's extremely common. Suicide has impacted everyone, but it's such a rare event that many of us can go years without it uh, uh, affecting us, right? So ev anyone around you has probably experienced something that has to do with this. So if you're suffering, recognize that you're not alone. And like you said, if nobody's reaching out to offer you that help, reach out and get that help yourself. And there's things like the, the Veteran Crisis Line, veterancrisisline.net. There's a number of different ways to talk to people. Um, every state now likely has a suicide prevention hotline. Um, there's a great program called Vets for Warriors, uh, retired General Mark Graham out of New Jersey, which is a, 
uh, not a crisis line, but it's a support line staffed by veterans for veterans. There's so much resources out there that if you find yourself in a dark place, if you find yourself suffering, you hear this, know that you're not alone and that the someone out there that can help you alleviate that suffering and you just got to keep looking for them until you find it. And, you know, it's finding those uh, resources. Like the veteran, what was the, the, the veteran suicide hotline? Isn't that... Uh available yeah. what is, uh, if you could let uh, people know what that is quickly sure so the veteran crisis line uh it's at veterancrisisline.net and the number is 1-800-273-8255 press one for military and veterans um and that is a crisis line that is ran by the department of veterans affairs mm -hmm. uh it's not just for va eligible veterans it's for all veterans all service members national guard reserve and their families uh, that is the, the National Veterans Crisis Line. But you can also find them at VeteranCrisisLine.net. They have a text function, they have a chat function, they might have a, pi a, a carrier pigeon function. They wanna help you, all you gotta do is reach out. Thank you, and I think that's such an important, you know, just reach out if you need it and, and get the support. You know, there's, it, uh, you know, it took me such a long time, Dwayne, to get to a place where I could really be satisfied with life satisfied with my own life to come from the edge of that and, and I and I try to you know uh, let people know that you can come back that it's not a, this is not a permanent situation and the time I thought it was at the time I thought gosh you know I, I, I didn't think I'd get out of the darkness I just didn't uh, I didn't think I would be here sitting with you but I am and so yes you can come back from the brink and uh, you know this was a tough topic you know, when we were when we were framing this uh, the series um, because it's so uh, personal. And you know you, in your book you say something that I really touched me and really I think is really important. And you say, yeah, you don't climb a mountain by saying you wish you could. And I thought it was such a truthful statement. You know when I was at that brink, I had to I had the awareness that I was I was I was in trouble. And then I needed to do something about it. And so that was that self-awareness that you were talking about. And if I would have kept going down that path without having that self-awareness, uh, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here. And so it's understanding that at that moment, I, and I was made the determination, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get out through this. I'm going to do whatever, I don't care what it takes, what it costs me. I'm going to climb up to the top of this mountain. <laughs> And that was the action that um, was I had to take. Can we affect change without the action? And how, Dwayne, can we find faith in ourselves again when, when maybe we've lost faith? Well, one of the things that I tell veterans is uh, we have endured much, and that proves that we can endure more, right? And it doesn't mean we need to endure suffering. This treatment, it's not... Uh, because say I'm, I'm 10 steps below zero, this isn't a way for me to get to zero because that's just the life with the absence of suffering. Like you, we need to choose life and we need to build a life worth living. So it's not get up to zero, we need to get above zero and we need to find a life of whatever kind of abundance that we talk about. But then just like, uh, you know, especially veterans and service members, to share that abundance with other people because that's what we are. That's what we do is we want to help others. That's really the drive. You know, I make the joke about not living in my dad's basement, but that was really it is I wanted to serve, right? And I found that the service was a really yeah. strong thing for me. So we can't serve others if we're down in the pit. So we need to climb the mountain, build a life worth living, and then turn around and help others up the hill. Absolutely. And that was one of the biggest motivators too for me was uh, was to be in service, was to take whatever lessons that I had gained from this experience and to be able to translate that in a way that would be able to help others to, uh, to climb the mountain themselves, to come from that edge and, and to reach in, in deep inside of them, to know that there's something deep inside of them that can carry them forward through any challenge, through any circumstance, through any crisis that they may be in, uh, through any trauma that they may have experienced, anything that would have tested their will and their soul, that they can come through it. And no, it's not easy. And that's why you gotta reach out to the people and help them out. And when you've, when you've crossed that bridge, you gotta reach back and say, here, I'm here to serve you. And to be in service, I think is such an important thing for veterans because that's, that we've gotta serve a higher cause. We've got to, it's just part of our makeup. 
It's part of why we heard the call to be uh, service members in the first place was because we heard that that higher call. Um, I can't believe we're at two o'clock. <laughs> Um, usually happens. It does when we're in these. I don't want it to end the conversation. I mean, I want to have you back on again for sure, uh, Dwayne. And folks, we are we are doing this Veteran Summit special series here on the council here at KUHS TV Radio. It is in partnership with the Trauma Sensitive Awareness Foundation. Uh, this is part one. Uh, and it's a special 10-part series filled with information, hope, inspiration, and healing. We're exploring cutting-edge treatments and alternative therapies, hearing pioneering veterans and mental injury experts. We are finding hope for PTS, TBI, moral injury, sleep disturbance, family conflict, emotional trauma, and so much more. Part 2 debuts in November at www t-saf.org that's again that's t-saf.org and we are broadcasting here live at kuhsdenver.com thank you Henry and everybody here at KUHS uh, KUHS the stream we are broadcasting from Denver all across the nation all around the world and we have best music best VDJs personalities Interviews. I mean, we have some of the best people working here. Tune in to KUHSDenver.com. Dwayne, um, thank you so much for being on the show today. It has been an honor and a privilege to meet you, sir, and to have you on the show. You are filled with wisdom and inspiration, strength and courage. Um, again, your website is Veteran Health. Uh, where is it? It's VeteranMentalHealth.com. Uh, Dwayne, I always ask my guests before we close out the show if they could give one bit of advice, one bit of wisdom from their life experience, what would it be? You know, in uh, the way I look at it, and hopefully this is a, a phrase or, or a concept that veterans can, can uh, latch on to, anyone can latch on to, as long as I have breath in my lungs, I have hope in my heart. Mm -hmm. And as long as I have hope in my heart, I'm going to live to see another day. <laughs> That's great. It's really great. Uh, and that is so true, having that hope in your heart. Uh, when you can find hope in, in that breath, in that moment, in that, uh, uh, in that experience of your life, life slowly becomes more and more enjoyable and your life becomes worth living. And your life is worth living. Folks, thank you so much for tuning in to the council. The council is adjourned. We will be back next Saturday. We are coming on Saturday, September 5th for our next show. Folks, may you all be well. May you all be free of pain and suffering. May you all be whole. God bless. We'll see you next week. Thank you.